Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. And now let's move on to our next talk. REST services present a backbone of all modern distributed uh, applications. And in today's world, where the main focus seems to be privacy, a secure usage of REST APIs is very important. And to shed some more light on the topic, let's welcome to the stage Alexander Radisavljevic. <laughs> Alexander, welcome to HIPCON. Thanks. The audience is yours. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Alexander Radisavljevic, as you heard before. So I come from a company called Endava, where we solve a plethora of different uh, issues for our customers. And in this talk, I'll focus on REST security. And security and performance were always kind of near and dear to me. So I'll try to, to show you the way to handle security in an efficient way. So let's go over briefly over the ag agenda. So we'll cover some historical ways of handling uh, security, such as basic auth, session IDs. Then we'll move on to OAuth 2 and JWTs and how those uh, can be combined. And there is also a new player in this field called HTTP signatures, uh, which is using similar technology to JWTs and, and is very promising for various reasons. So uh, let's see. Basic OAuth uh, is a basically a method of authentication. Uh, it's not very secure. Uh, there is no confidentiality because it's using Base64 encoded combination of username and password. And it's very heavy on your LDAP server or, or user database where you would, on each request, check for validity by comparing the, the username and password against the, the storage. So this is not a very uh, recommended way of doing authentication, but maybe uh, some all leg legacy projects are, are still dealing, dealing with this. So the main takeaway here is to at least use HTTPS, because if you are connecting over uh, unsecured Wi-Fi or something similar, which is not that often nowadays, but can be the case sometimes. So you should anyway always use HTTPS when it comes to anything that needs to be secured. So let's move on to session ID, sco ID cookies. So, uh, now, in, in previous example, you needed to uh, your secret, your credential would credentials would hit the wire each time a request is sent. Now there is a way to exchange that uh, uh, those credentials for a session ID, uh, which would be kind of a pointer to a notification object that will be stored somewhere on your infrastructure. So this is the basic idea. You will post your uh, uh, username and password combination uh, via some login URL. Uh, the server will verify that against the database. Uh, then it will create an authentication object context, uh, authentication context uh, maybe, and uh, set it in your memory. Uh, we'll store that in a cookie and send that back to the browser, to the client, uh, which will then, uh, on each request, send you this session ID where you would go uh, to the memory and check it. If everything is, is fine, if you can find this ID, then you would show uh, a welcome message to your user. So if your architecture looks like this, then this is a perfectly fine approach. Uh, but perhaps after some time, you're uh, starting to get more and more uh, requests and more and more users. And then you uh, need to introduce uh, some kind of scaling to your architecture. So normally, you would introduce a load balancer and create a bunch of nodes, uh, which would then handle your, uh, your web application services. Uh, now, if you look at the example from before, if the fourth server receives this uh, initial request uh, and it knows about it, then everything is fine. But since now you have multiple servers uh, handling your web application. Then maybe this first one doesn't know about this session ID, so you have a problem. 
Uh, now you can introduce some kind of shared caching, and you heard all, all about it uh, on Rafal's uh, um, talk just before this one. Um, then, but this way you're introducing a, a single point of failure again to your to your architecture. Uh, you can imply all different mechanics for preventing this, maybe some redundancy, or you can introduce a distributed cache, and then all your servers will know about uh, each ID uh, at all times. But there is uh, also another approach uh, called sticky sessions, uh, which solves this without introducing another uh, additional uh, infrastructure to a system uh, where you would tell your load balancer to remember where the uh, session originated from, and this way uh, it will always send requests coming from same origin to the same location. But if this server goes down, then you again have a problem. So uh, before we move on, there is a solution to this. And uh, the solution ex is actually by using uh, different types of tokens. But uh, before we move on to that, I want to uh, talk briefly about uh, a uh, OAuth 2 protocol, which kind of introduces a standardization to, uh, to this whole process. Because before you would create uh, your login forms and they could be whatever you make them to be. So uh, it's not very uh, systematic approach. So what, what is good thing about the standards is that they are stable. And if something wrong comes up, uh, then in next revision, uh, those issues would be fixed. But if you do not use standards, you, then you're uh, opening yourself to, to all kinds of problems. Maybe uh, you experience the bugs that are all with early, early already solved uh, in, in uh, a framework like this. So uh, OAuth 2 specification, if you like to read RFCs, uh, is defined in 6749. And basically, it comes down to defining a roles, grants, and uh, types of tokens uh, that you can uh, use to, uh, to implement auth authentication inside, inside your system. So, Roles are basically, uh, you have your resource owner that's usually uh, referred to as end user. Uh, but if it's not a person, then, and then it's, it's simply a resource owner. Uh, you have your resource server, which is holding protected resources. So that would be your, your API server, your, your web application. Uh, so it, it can uh, accept and respond to protected re resource requests. Uh, and it does so by verifying uh, access tokens. And uh, you have your client, uh, and that's basically application that uh, a resource owner is using to access protected resources. Uh, so the, the client itself doesn't imply any particular information characteristic, characteristics, and it can be a mobile app, web app, or, or whichever flavor you like. So, and finally, we have authorization server, uh, and that is the server that actually issues access token and handles uh, authentication for you. Uh, and then by issuing those access token, the, the, uh, reser the client can, can use those to access research servers. So basically come down to, to defining a different roles inside of your ar architecture and uh, uh, this way, you can differen differentiate it who, uh, who, who can do what. Uh, so this is a basic or to uh, protocol flow. Uh, your client would issue an authorization request towards resource owner, uh, and then resource owner would uh, give, give the client a grant to access now with this grant authorization server, which then gives back the client access token. Now you use this access token to access any uh, protected resources on, on a resource server. So uh, there are a couple of grants 
that your application can use. So now you see that there, that there, come, there is a sort of system is systematization to the uh, usual login form that, that you maybe have. So authorization code is the most used one. Uh, it's also the safest one because this way your uh, client never sees your, uh, your secret. So the whole point of this is to uh, share the secret uh, as least as we can. So ideally, we, wouldn't, uh, we, we would want to, to have our secret never hit the wire. So it never can be stolen uh, by maybe some men in the middle attacks or, or something similar. So uh, with authorization code, you still enter your cr client credential, but now you do it directly on the authorization server. And the good thing about this is that uh, authorization server doesn't have to be something that uh, is, uh, you can use a third party authorization servers, such as Google or Facebook, they have this capability. So you can log in using their authorization servers to your, uh, to your services. Uh, so uh, this uh, authorization code works like, uh, so you, you would post your credentials, then it would give you an authorization code, which then you cha exchange for, for an access token. There is also implicit grant, which is uh, kind of uh, more designed to be used in, uh, uh, in JavaScript web applications, single page web, web applications, where uh, you would directly, uh, instead of issuing you authorization code, it would directly give you the uh, uh, access token. And there is also a resource owner password grant. Uh, this one skips the whole uh, story with uh, authorization server. So, uh, I mean, with authorization code. So it directly uh, uh, sends your credentials. Uh, so in this way, you are actually entering credentials in inside your uh, client. So this is not very uh, this is not uh, recommended when the, when the client is not something that you uh, control. And also <coughs> there is a client credentials grant. Uh, this is used for resources that are uh, under control of a client itself. So when you have a case where maybe your client needs to register or, uh, against your web applications before uh, before actual users registers to access some uh, protected resources, then you would use uh, client credentials grant. Uh, so we come to to tokens, and uh, tokens are actually uh, same as session IDs. Uh, if you do not use, uh, if if you use it like a, a short string or something, it will. Again, represent the same situation. You will have the same situation in terms of performances uh, by using uh, those kind of tokens. Uh, because what you achieved with this is actually, instead of having uh, one combination of your username and password, now you have a bunch of username and passwords that have their expiration time. Uh, they are uh, constantly refreshed. and. Uh, but the, the situation is still the same. You, have to, you need to have a storage for uh, authentication objects back on your, or on your back end. Uh, also, uh, this is somewhat better than, than session ID because uh, now you uh, need to re-enter your credentials uh, a bit less because you have something that's called refresh token. So when your access token is about to expire, uh, then you would use a refresh token rent uh, to gain, uh, to obtain another access token. So now we move on to something uh, that is uh, kind of better uh, in terms of uh, doing an efficient way of uh, this is like an efficient version of uh, of your token. So instead of storing your authentication context back on the backend, 
you would now store it inside of a token itself. Because JWT is a, a JSON object. Uh, it has claims inside, so uh, the claims, uh, there are some public claims that are predefined that you can use uh, for, will be on the next example, example will be on the next slide. But um, the JWT is not uh, a cookie, it compares to session ID. So that means that JWT can be also used, uh, can be transferred via cookie, but it can be transferred via authorization bearer header, for example. Uh, so uh, they come in two flavors. Uh, there is signed JWTs, which are widely, widely used. Uh, so signed J JWTs are uh, those JSON objects with, which have the, their headers and uh, payload, and then uh, those two are combined, uh, joined with a dot, and uh, a digital signature is computated upon that input data, and then that signature is uh, prepended to, to the token, and the whole thing is, is, uh, becomes your JWT. So there is a nice analogy that I uh, heard before. So you have your tokens by reference and your tokens by value. And the session IDs would be your tokens by reference. And it's similar to credit cards. If you uh, have someone's credit card, you, you do not know uh, how much money that person has. But if they give you a $500 bill, then you would know exactly uh, <laughs> that that person was rich before. Uh, and now you are. So uh, that dollar bill has uh, uh, its uh, maybe watermark or something like that. So you can verify that it's a real bill. So the same thing applies to uh, JWTs. So now our flow from a few moments ago with session IDs, now with JWTs would be something like this. You would. Uh, this example doesn't show the, the usage with OAuth, but uh, what I want to show is that now you would still go to your uh, database, any persistent layer that, that is used to store your uh, authentication context for that user or, or authentication data, your username and password. Uh, you would then create uh, a JWT and sign it, return that as a cookie to your browser, uh, it will then uh, uh, get, give you back this cookie. You would uh, verify, then read it. So it's very important to do a verification uh, because th those tokens, are, since they are base64 encoded, uh, they are not opaque, so you can uh, get into a trap of just reading it and uh, skipping the verification part. So it's very important to be careful when it comes to uh, anything uh, related to security. So. With just a bit computational power, you're achieving something that you needed a round trip to database or maybe to cache, uh, uh, and you're, 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 uh, you can authenticate your user. Uh, so this is a uh, example of a JWT structure. You have your algorithms and your types in, inside of header, uh, and you have your payload, which contains meaningful information. Uh, in this example, uh, there is a subject. This could be your user, uh, user ID. Uh, there is a name. Maybe you don't need it. If you don't want to include any personal identifiable information, which is nowadays important since GDPR. Uh, also, uh, you have your issue that. You have your expiry time. And the ID, this one is important for uh, a uh, also, there is a downside to using JWTs, and I'll explain that in a bit. And also, you can include your uh, <coughs> access rights that the user have. Uh, so all of that is then uh, inputted into a fun function. So we can use, in this example, HMAC SHA-256. Uh, apply your 256-bit uh, secret. It's important to have a large secrets because uh, uh, the shorter ones can be easily brute, force it, brute forced. Uh, 
And finally, your uh, JSON web token will look like uh, shown below. Uh, so you achieved a uh, simple load balancing. Now every server, just by having your uh, secret key, can verify your uh, issued tokens. You, so you don't have to go out of server to verify. You, you don't have to hit the wire again uh, with uh, sensible information. And it's stateless. So the state is actually uh, in the token itself. And uh, this can be used effectively with microservices. Now you wonder, uh, it's not a good thing to share your secret among all the different nodes in your system. And maybe you're using some uh, third party integrations as well. And you, you wouldn't want to give them out your, your secret key. Uh, so JWTs also support asymmetric, uh, uh, asymmetric signing algorithms, uh, such as RSA uh, or ECDSA. Uh, so you can use uh, anything you, you really like. Uh, so you can have your uh, security provider, which would then uh, hold your private key, and your public key will be distributed among all others. Uh, you need to be careful with this. If your public key is publicly obtainable via URL, which also JWT uh, support, so someone can uh, try to uh, make an attack on your services by uh, making a token uh, that is signed by your public key uh, and tricking you into by specifying the algorithm uh, to be uh, HS256 uh, and then you would uh, get your key ID and say okay I know this key Let's decrypt with uh, my public key, and then it would be a valid token. So you need to be careful which keys are are for what purpose. So those are some implementation issues that maybe you ran into if you're using uh, an older older li libraries. But uh, you need to be careful with that. And finally, uh, these things can be used. Uh, together. Uh, your access token is usually opaque, but that is not ma mandatory specification. Uh, does not uh, specify the token format. Uh, you can, it, uh, as I said, removes the need to check the token storage for verification. But your refresh tokens to, should uh, still check the database, uh, because maybe user was deleted in the meantime. Uh, and on the refresh token, it, it should be good enough to, uh, if the, your access token expiry time is, is short enough. And we come to drawbacks. Uh, token revocation is a bit problematic uh, when it comes to, to JWTs because uh, as long they, as their expiry time is uh, not expired yet, uh, the token itself would be valid. So if it's a web app, you can just set a new cookie uh, but if someone steals the old one, it would be still valid. So if you want to be really safe, then you should uh, implement some kind of blacklist. Uh, but blacklists are not as good as whitelists because you always want to say, uh, no one can enter, and here's the list of people that can. Uh, if blacklist fails, then uh, everyone can enter. So there are some security considerations uh, of JWTs on single page web apps. Uh, so uh, that's XSS. XSS is uh, cross-site uh, cross scripting, or when someone injects a malicious, malicious scripts on your website, maybe you have a, a comment section on your website, and if you're not sanitizing your input, a malicious script can end up uh, uh, on your page. And uh, when uh, registered users open that page, then those, the script can uh, pull out uh, your cookie if you're storing it uh, in, a, in a local, uh, I mean your uh, access token if you're storing it in, a, in maybe a local storage. So also third party scripts, so you should make sure that uh, you have your own copies that are, uh, you're not pulling them from, from other websites. Uh, 
and always sanitize your your input to prevent uh, this attack. But you can also prevent it with uh, using a cookie that has HTTP only and secure flag, and that means that no JavaScript can see this cookie, so they cannot just say document.cookies uh, and, and, and see those cookies. Uh, but then you're open to CSRF attack, uh, which is cross-site request forgery, and if someone makes a uh, malicious.com, which will post to Twitter uh, a tweet uh, on your behalf. Uh, there is a synchronizer token that is actually a hidden input field inside your form. And uh, in this case, you can use your local storage to store CSRF token on the, uh, on the, uh, when you do the first authentication. Uh, so this way, uh, you're kind of protecting yourself against this attack. There's also another approach uh, that I uh, learned fairly recently, it kind of defies uh, OAuth to some of the OAuth 2 specifications, but if you keep your access token in memory and you refresh token in cookie, then no one can obtain your uh, access token. And in this way, you, you will have to... Uh, uh, have some background uh, authentication task that would periodically uh, refresh your access token. Because now, if you uh, move on to a different page uh, or new tab, you will be automatically logged out since you do not have uh, your access token since lo local storage is gone. Uh, but first thing you do is that you go use your refresh token to do this. But then again, you're using your refresh token inside a cookie, which is not really the purpose of a re refresh token. So those are some co considerations that you, you need to account for when, when using this. And uh, finally, there are HTTP signatures. Th these are fairly new in this field. And what JWTs uh, uh, do not provide you with is that they never prove the, uh, that the origin is actual, uh, uh, actually controls the secret uh, that is used to uh, issue an access token or JWT token in the first hand. So it's like a passport without a picture. So anyone holding your uh, JWT uh, can impersonate you. And this specification is still in draft form, but where so some companies are, are already using them. I believe that Amazon CLI uh, client for accessing AVS is, is using uh, something similar to this. Uh, so, how does this work? Uh, you would uh, have your, when you register to a certain web service, you would get your uh, secret and uh, a key which you would use to cryptographically sign uh, certain headers inside your message each time you send a request to server, and then the server, by knowing your key and, and uh, key ID, you uh, can uh, also verify that this is actually you. So, by uh, uh, you're proving your identity by the uh, uh, fact that you're controlling the secret key. So also, it, uh, similar as uh, JWT uses digital signatures, so uh, you have your independent signing and ver verifying without going out of, uh, of this, uh, your node uh, itself. So. This is how it looks like. Uh, you're using your, uh, let's say you're posting a, uh, a request, and uh, there are a couple of headers, host, date, content type, and digest is uh, something that enables us to do a message integrity, because digest would be your uh, hash of the body of the message. So you included that as well in, in signature. And <coughs> you generate uh, authorization header, which is called signature in this case, uh, which will have your key ID and algorithm, and the headers that are used to create this signature. Now you base64 encode it, apply your signing uh, function, and you append that to the server, and then 
on the receiving end, uh, a client would get uh, the same uh, headers and apply this the same function now knowing your secret key. Uh, or maybe it's a symmetric encryption, so it's your uh, public key. Uh, and this can work in both ways. You can verify a server, and and a uh, server can verify that it is actually you. So to sum up, uh, digital signatures are something that is driving uh, security in modern day. Uh, it keeps stuff stateless, uh, which means uh, more security and, um, I'm, let's say, more efficient way to do, uh, to do this and also uh, we need to have a standardization in this field. So, uh, since the security is uh, an important topic, you would uh, you would want to have a, a prov proven methods to do uh, to do this. So, uh, okay, this is an, another slide. So, uh, thank you all. Uh, if you have any questions. Thank you, Alexander. Any questions for Alexander? <laughs> any questions? Obviously not. Okay, thank you. Okay, if not, Once again. hit me up on my newly created yeah. Twitter account. <laughs>